It is game day on Gamecock Central Radio. Emerson Phillips here with the Gamecock Central crew. We're going to start with Chris Clark today. Wes Mitchell will join us later. And we'll also be joined on today's game day podcast by staff writer Colin Taylor. And we'll hear from Roddy Nabolsi, who is the publisher of our Rivals Network partner, UGASports.com, to get a look at the Georgia perspective on today's show. Chris, welcome in. How you doing, bud? Thanks for having me. Doing great. Excited about uh, what should be a really good atmosphere in williams Bryce Stadium today and two Two top 25 teams with an SEC East clash early this season. It ought to be a good one. Yeah, national TV game makes it, makes it even more exciting. We know about the possible implications in the SEC East. First shots fired in the East every year between the Gamecocks and the Bulldogs. And, Chris, I think a lot of Gamecock fans like the fact that the game has been moved back to the early part of the schedule. You know, last couple of years it was week seven or eight. Now it's back where it, I feel it belongs. Week two, first SEC game for both teams. Yeah, it's really interesting that it's this early, um, you know, Right off the bat, you get a game that's going to have huge implications in the East because, I mean, Georgia is the team that rightfully so has been pegged by the media as the preseason favorite. I think a lot of that is, you know, you always see sort of, I guess, some goodwill carry over from last season. This is a team that just uh, is coming off an appearance in the national title game, was was leading it at one point in that national title game, had a very good shot to win it. Um, they're a very, very talented squad. They did they did lose a lot from that team, but they also returned some key pieces and have some new additions that are really going to help them out too. And uh, their roster is uh, one of the most talented in college football overall. I mean, it's, it's probably in the top five, top ten, certainly in terms mm-hmm. of talent in college football. And aside from that, you've also got the Gamecocks, who are in year three of Will Muschamp era, looking to make a statement this year. And look, I mean, this is not a game that either team, I don't know that you could call it a, a must win for either team in order to win the East, but certainly whoever wins this game is going to make their path a lot more manageable going forward. Two games every year seem to mean more to the fans. They're special. They're just a little bit more important than all the others, and that's Clemson and that's Georgia, Chris. So, you know, the fact that Georgia's a neighboring state obviously has got a lot to do with that. Let's go back to your comment. You said Georgia lost a lot off of last year's team. <clears throat> And that's true, they did, Mm -hmm. particularly on offense. But they signed eight five-star prospects in the last uh, (laughs) signing period, and they had the number one recruiting class in the country. So how much of that is momentum, you know, off the success of their season last year, making an appearance in the national title game and almost winning the daggum thing? And how much of that is Kirby Smart, their new head coach? Or maybe it's a combination of the two, Chris. Yeah, I I mean, I I think Emerson, you look at this team, they walked, I think, 31 seniors. Now, not all those were guys who played or contributed, but uh, a lot of them were. And so they lost a lot of that experience defensively and offensively and on special teams even. And um, they also lost, you know, Roquan Smith, who was one of maybe the best defensive player in the country last year, linebacker, and Trent Thompson, a big defensive tackle. Um, But that said, they they do have a lot of guys back. And – the, the guys that they're trying to replace, they have some people who have – you look at their front four. I mean, they lost some guys there. They lost some guys in their back end, but they have some guys who have played some football, particularly up front, um, as you rotate guys in and out. Now, they do have some youth. Tyson Campbell at corner is a freshman, but he's also a five-star freshman. And uh, they have some guys that will be putting on the field. Brenton Cox, defensive end, I imagine will play a good bit. Former five-star guy, Justin Fields at quarterback come in some certain packages to spell Jake Fromm. Mm. Fromm is back. DeAndre Swift at running back. They have a huge offensive line. Mm. They lost the first-round pick off of it, and Isaiah Wynn uh, to the Patriots from left tackle. But, you know, they, they roll another guy in there, switch him over from the right side. and They have a lot of talent and a lot of size up there and a lot of team speed. And then you factor in Demetrius Robertson, a Georgia native who was a transfer from Cal, former five-star prospect, too. And then, you know, uh, Miko Hardman and Terry Godwin. So, I mean, look, whether it's offensively a lot of firepower um, and Jim Chaney does a good job with that offense, then Kirby Smart obviously is well-regarded. They have a very good system, philosophy, and a lot of talent to work with. So I think a lot of it is, look, this is a very talented team. It's easy to see that. And a lot of the key pieces that come back and a lot of the pieces that they um, got, whether it's some key freshmen or a transfer like Robertson, um, you know, lead people to believe that this is going to be a very good team. And, and I certainly think this is a very, very good team that South Carolina is going to match up against. Chris, you mentioned the size of the Georgia offensive line. I believe they average 6'4", 315 across the front, and two of their linemen are 6'6", 340 pounds. 
They're the biggest mm-hmm. line the Gamecocks are going to see all year. Yeah, they're massive. I mean, uh, Will Muschamp mentioned that the right side of their offensive line is a human eclipse. So there's a <laughs> phrase that he's used a few times. And they're, they're just massive. And, and, you know, Andrew Thomas moves over from right tackle to left tackle this season. Very athletic kid. Uh, they got Cade Mays, who's a freshman, former five-star guy who can come in. Isaiah Wilson from New York's a five-star guy that they landed in their previous recruiting class. And so, um, you know, he'll be on the right side. So uh, th- they've got they've got some, a blend of experience and talent up there in size. And for a team like South Carolina, you know, you feel good about their first four guys and then some of the backup guys. But particularly a defensive tackle, they're, they're a little young. You know, when you talk about having to factor in some first-year players who are going to be good, but right now a little more undersized, J.J. and Igbari, you know, um, Rick Sandage will be in there. Jabari Ellis, a little undersized, he'll be in there. You know, guys who are going to be good players as, as soon as this year and already played in the first game, but just inexperienced and a little smaller. And so for South Carolina, I think that is a concern of theirs is in terms of the depth and being able to stop a Georgia offensive attack that can, can really lean on you in the run, uh, but also hit some RPOs, hit some big plays in the passing game. I think that's going to be a challenge. Lean on you is exactly right, and that's what the Bulldogs have done in recent years against the Gamecocks, Chris. Georgia's won the last three in the series, but the Gamecocks won three in a row at williams Bryce prior to the most recent meeting in Columbia. So talk about that size advantage when Georgia's got the football, Chris. How much of an advantage is that going to be for them? Because we know they like to run the football, and they're going to come in here trying to do exactly that today. What are the Gamecocks going to be able to do to counter yeah. that big Georgia line? Well, I think there, there's a few keys to that. Now, you got to play as well as possible up front, and Georgia's going to get some yardage. They're going to hit some plays in the passing game. Jake Crom's a very smart quarterback who can make all the throws on, his, on the field. And one thing we saw in the game last year, each game stands on its own, but you can sort of see some of the formulas. South Carolina had just about a, a 200 yards on the nose rushing disparity between they rushed forward what Georgia rushed for. Georgia was about 250 yards. South Carolina was about 50, give or take a few yards for each. About a 200-yard differential. So Nick Chubb and Sony Michelle had great games. Yeah, they were really the difference. Kirby Smart said that after the game. Uh, those guys aren't there anymore, but Georgia still has some good backs. Fromm's a year older even, and they're probably better at receiver this season, I would, I would certainly argue, than they were last year, especially with adding Robertson to the fold. So, South Carolina last season would try to stack the box a lot to stop the run. That was their game plan. Uh, but Fromm hit them on some RPO stuff and man coverage and did a really nice job, and that's that's part of the, the give and take of, of calling plays against these guys. So, I think it's going to be getting them into – stopping the run early, getting them into some uh, third third downs and distances that make them uncomfortable, and then getting off the field on third down because you don't want to get into um, a situation where your starters are playing a ton of snaps into the fourth quarter and, and wearing down against the big line. So mm. that's going to be a key. I mean, creating a turnover or two would, would certainly be significant. And then South Carolina needs to score some points on offense to to sort of alleviate some of that pressure off the defense. Yes, sir. I think ball control for the Gamecocks is critical today. Uh, If the Gamecocks can run the ball, they can shorten this game, keep that Georgia offense off the field, and that was sort of the recipe for success for the Gamecocks against Georgia back in the Marcus Lattimore days. And that brings us to our first call of the day from the Gamecocks Central Hotline. I'm going to give you the number. It's 803-497-9058. 497 9058, the GC hotline open for you 24 7. And our first call today comes from Pete. He's talking about Marcus Lattimore here, and he talks about Mon Denson a little bit as well. So, Chris, I'm going to let you handle a, a question here from Pete, a Gamecock Central member. Hello, this is Pete Funk from Gamecock Central. With the return of Mon Denson at running back, this gives me, you know, uh, some great memories of how we handled Georgia with Marcus Lattimore, how we controlled the ground game and basically kept the offense off the field. Do you see us, with our improved offensive line, using the same philosophy this weekend against the Georgia Bulldogs? Thank you. Well, yeah, Pete, thanks for the question. I mean, look, South Carolina will be at full strength at running back, and there were certainly encouraging signs last week. Now, Georgia will be a lot bigger, a lot faster, a lot more talented and skilled and well-schooled than Costa was defensively. Uh, they were just really outmatched. But there were there were still really positive signs for South Carolina in the running game. They didn't have any negative plays. 
They got a hat on the hat. They blocked things extremely well. And Rico Dowdle and Tyson Williams and even A.J. Turner in very limited carries did a really nice job of running through contact, getting some bull yardage, breaking some tackles. And that was an encouraging sign, I thought. I mean, all those guys are healthy. Denson, you know, could, could potentially get in there in some short yardage situations as well or, or if one of the other backs needs a breather. But, I mean, this is a different type of offense. South Carolina was running at that time in, in some ways. Um, when Marcus really burst onto the scene as a freshman. But certainly, they would love to be able to run the football against Georgia because, you know, Georgia's got, you know, some questions maybe at linebacker. Um, they lost some guys up front that were tackling machines and really disruptive for them, like Roquan Smith and Trent Thompson. They have a little bit of youth there at linebacker. And so, certainly, South Carolina would love to be able to run the football and, and really open things up in the passing game, I think. Uh, they're going to have to hit some explosive plays, and if they can create those in the run game, that, that'd be even better. All right, Pete, thanks for the phone call on the GC hotline, 497-9058. You call that number, you'll get a prompt for voicemail. Just leave your question on the voicemail. Nobody's going to answer the call, but we'll get your call, and we'll play the recording on next week's Gamecock Central Game Day podcast, 497-9058 on the Gamecock Central hotline. All right, we'll get back to the hotline later. Emerson Phillips with Chris Clark here on the Game Day Podcast. Wes Mitchell will be along shortly, and we're going to hear from Colin Taylor and Roddy Nabolsi from UGASports.com also on today's show. Chris, I want to go back to uh, the Gamecock defensive line. You talked about Carolina being maybe a little bit undersized, particularly at you know backup positions against the Georgia O-line. And as I was watching DJ Wanham leave last week's game with an injury, I'm thinking, man, the Gamecocks are really going to need him against Georgia next week. They're going to need him. They're going to need him to be 100%. And I'm not sure he is 100%. Wanham led the team in sacks and tackles for loss last year, and he's the Gamecocks' biggest force on the D-line. Yeah, he's a key player. And, uh, you know, no doubt, look, we'll, we'll just have to see when the game happens later today, so the status is there, how he looks. Um, certainly, it, it's not ideal to have him less than 100%. And I just don't see any way he's going to be 100% out there after <laughs> sustaining an ankle sprain a week ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, he's someone that's just so key because he can do a lot of different things for you. Like you said, Emerson rushed the passer, stop guys in the backfield, help set the edge, and stop the run, and that'll be crucial in this game. So they'll, they'll have to sort of pick up any slack that may be there. George is about a nine-and-a-half-point favorite coming into today's game. 339 official kick time national TV game on CBS. And really one of the, the, the best games of the year, Chris, particularly you know when it's a home game for South Carolina. I think the fans come out. It's obviously going to be packed to the gills at Williams-Brice today. The mid-afternoon start time is good. A lot of folks are you know, arriving for their tailgate early in the morning, and people are going to get pretty well lubricated for the game today, and it always makes it fun. <laughs> You're exactly right, man. Ought to be ought to be a really really good atmosphere at Williams Price. I think uh, I think only a night game would would rival what this atmosphere will will be later today. Um, but I certainly think think back to you know the number one Alabama uh, game back in the day it was a three thirty CBS game, and yep. I think this one feels a little bit like that. You know, it's got that type of feel. And yep. certainly, uh, when I look back at some of the games that I've covered uh, in my time with GamecockCentral dot com. That Alabama game was was one of the best in terms of atmosphere, and certainly the way that the team was performing on the field had really fed the fans and vice versa. Um, but uh, I think it's certainly going to be a really good one today. Great matchup today. Georgia's ranked number three in the country, and the Gamecocks cracked the top 25 with the win over Coastal last week. So national TV game and a couple of top 25 ball clubs is going to be fun. Chris, what do you see happening today? I think it's going to be a close physical fourth quarter game I mean that that's really it's a game that I think the nine and a half point line it seems a little high and probably you know the reason I highlighted explosive plays earlier is I think it's going to come down to one or two big plays whichever team can you know take care of the ball the best but probably even just make one or two more big plays is probably going to walk away victorious and I think it's going to come down in the fourth quarter Final question for you, Chris. Georgia used two quarterbacks last week, and Rodney Nabolsi told us earlier this week on GCR that he thinks they're going to play two QBs in every game this year. How much of Justin Fields do you think we'll see today? I think we'll see him. You know, it depends on the flow of the game, as always. I mean, even even coaching staff come in with a certain plan or, or situational plan, uh, you know, what they may draw up. Hey, if this happens, we'll do this. Uh, but I think that the plan for Georgia going in is certainly to get him in on a 
on a couple or a few series, or maybe just put him in down in the red zone uh, where he can be more of a run threat down there, uh, run some of the RPO stuff, give give him an, an opportunity to go run some zone read concepts and things like that, and, and just really when the field shrinks down there in the red zone, having a having a running quarterback on your offense makes things even more difficult for the defense defending you. So um, I, I think that would be a, a situation where it's right for Justin Fields to come in. And he's he's young, but he's a talented thrower. He can throw it, and he's certainly very athletic too. So that'll be a challenge for South Carolina too. Fields is 6'3", 225, five-star prospect, a freshman quarterback for Georgia, and he's been compared to Cam Newton, Chris. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a – Boy, if he turns out uh, three quarters as good as Cam Newton, then he's going to cause a lot of a lot of people headaches in the SEC. He certainly, look, he, he he was very talented kid in high school, and I think he's shown flashes of what he can do at Georgia. Jake Fromm's a guy who's earned the starting job. I think he's a fantastic quarterback, at great leadership qualities, can make every throw, very heady, very smart, and runs their offense to a T. So I think there's a place for both of them to play on this team, and, and it does seem. Uh, like they're both going to play this season. It'll be interesting to see how they handle it and how South Carolina has to defend it. Well, personally speaking, I'm far more concerned about Jake Fromm and that Georgia line, the Georgia ground game, than I am about Justin Fields. But Fields is talented, too. So Georgia's loaded again, Chris. It's going to be fun. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. All right, that's Chris Clark. Chris has game day duties today. We're going to turn him loose, and we're going to bring in Wes Mitchell here on the Gamecock Central Game Day Podcast. Wes Mitchell joins us now on the Gamecock Central Game Day Podcast. Carolina and Georgia today, 339 kickoff national TV game on CBS. Wes, man, what an atmosphere at williams Bryce. People have been looking forward to this game all summer. Yeah, you know, I think, uh, Emerson, we've been talking about this game in the media all summer as well, and the, the players have uh, not been able to talk about it. They've not wanted to talk about it. The coaches have refused to talk about it until this week. But, you know, let's be honest, as far as the collective – Gamecock Nation this game has been circled probably since the dang schedule was put out like it's South Carolina it's Georgia they're now two top 25 teams um it's sold out this is uh I think Jacob August said this is why you come to South Carolina Mm -hmm. if you're a fan this this is why you follow South Carolina is for days like South Carolina versus Georgia that's exactly right. And, Wes, so we got a phone call for you here on the Gamecock Central Hotline. We're going to get to it in just a moment. But let's talk about the Gamecock offense a little bit. Chris and I talked extensively about the Georgia offensive line, the incredible size that they've got up front, and Georgia's ability to lean on you in the running game. And we know that's what the dogs are going to try to do today. But let's take a look at the other side of the football here and start with the Gamecock offense. I think we saw improvement from the Gamecock offense last week. You know, the offense was solid. I mean, they scored basically from start to finish, Wes, but a much different test today, obviously, against a Georgia team that is incredibly athletic and, you know, maybe the fastest defense Carolina will see all year. Yeah, you know, I think, first of all, starting with what we saw from the Coastal game is that, you know, this offense executed, man. I mean, they scored while the first unit was in there. They scored on six of their seven possessions total. I mean, 42 points and – You know, Emerson, none of those drives were on short field. I think in the past when South Carolina has had an opportunity to put up some big points, either the defense was scoring or, you know, special teams was chipping in. Like last year when when Debo scored against NC State and Missouri, obviously, you know, you look back at the Arkansas game last year on paper, there were big points, but the defense uh, chipped in a bunch of turnovers and defensive scores. Um, This not only did they not really get help from the defense or special team scoring, but all six of those scoring drives were basically the length of the field. So uh, they went up and down the field, didn't really have to turn up the tempo to to smack speed either. Like to me, Emerson was very, very businesslike on offense. They looked uh, like they were under control. They looked like they knew what they were doing, which for a new scheme, new offensive coordinator, new quarterbacks coach, um, Man, all, all those things on, on week one are, are positive. I, I don't care if you're doing it against air. Just the way that they executed to me was uh, was pretty impressive. Like you said, now we you know we we see we see for real what do they have uh, against Georgia this weekend. Yeah, they looked organized, they looked controlled, and they looked like they knew exactly what they were out to do. So that was good to see. Wes, how vanilla was the Gamecock offense last week, and how much different do you think it'll be today against Georgia? Yeah, you know, not not completely vanilla. We, you know, we saw some wrinkles. We saw them get Debo Samuel involved in a number of ways. We, you know, he mostly plays outside. But they did put him in the slot a couple of times, and um, 
did that little sweep uh, forward pass that, you know, I think West Virginia made popular that game. They blew out Clemson in the bowl game, uh, you know, maybe five years ago or something. And now that thing's sort of caught on because it's, uh, you know, forward pass, but it's really a run. Um, if, if you think about it. So they, you know, they got Debo involved in a number of ways. They put him in the backfield at running back. That's something I think we can maybe see more of this week uh, is them getting him the ball in the backfield. Uh, so it wasn't completely van- vanilla, but, hey, I, I don't think they showed anywhere near – you know, I don't think they reached into the bag of tricks yet. You know, I think there's a lot more for this offense to, to show, not just this week, but as the year goes on. And I, I think this is one of the games where you really start to – to unveil, you know, what this offense is, what it can be. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, Emerson, I, I think that uh, this offense, regardless of opponent last week, I think this offense is, is good. Like, I, I think this matchup favors bo- both offenses. Like, you know, Chris was talking about Georgia's offensive line. I think you give Georgia's offense the edge on South Carolina's defense matchup-wise, but – I look at the weapons Carolina has on offense. Jake Bentley looking so calm and under control. You know, the running backs, the offensive line. I think you give South Carolina's offense the edge versus Georgia's defense. So both both offenses could have a fun day. Hmm. All right, Wes, you know, I, I see this game going one of two ways for the Carolina offense today. Obviously, Carolina would like to run the football. If Dowdle and Tyson Williams and A.J. Turner and Mon Denson can get running downhill, that obviously favors South Carolina. I think that you know, shortens the game. It keeps the Georgia offense off the field. It allows the Gamecock defense to stay rested and fresh, and, and that's obviously the best-case scenario for the Gamecocks. But I think Carolina can also win. You know, even if they don't have a great day rushing the football, I think Jake Bentley could prove that he's the best quarterback in the game. And it may take that kind of day from Bentley for South Carolina to win, but we're going to find out, you know, if Jake's got that in him. And I believe he does. Will he deliver that type of performance today? That remains to be seen, but you know, I could see Bentley having a big day and that propelling the Gamecocks to a possible win here. So uh, what are the chances the Gamecocks just established a ground game against Georgia, and what are the chances Bentley comes out throwing it all over the yard? Yeah, I think um, ultimately, you know, in a perfect world, they want to do both those things. They want to be balanced. I have a feeling that after looking at what the offensive line did last week and um, – you know, and we have we have this pro football focus thing on on rivals now, where they grade every single player um, in the country, and then you can compare it. And Zach Bailey was like one of the top ten player graded players in the country, regardless of position, last week. And the South Carolina offensive line graded out as the best run blocking unit in the entire country. So um, that you know that what, does that mean a whole lot today? Maybe not. It's it's one week, but you know, I, I think if you're South Carolina, maybe they try to test this thing and really see what this front five can do. And I, I think you have a veteran offensive line. They've probably heard all week about how good Georgia's offensive line is, so they might have a little something to prove. I think if they can establish the run early on, then um, you know, then that'll be the plan. I, I think they'll stick to it and then use that to sort of go to all the other things that they want to do offensively. And uh, almost in a way, as I'm saying it, sort of give Georgia a little bit of a taste of their own medicine because that is a Georgia defense that lost, um, you know, I think eight starters from last year. So uh, they, they maybe haven't faced quite what they're going to face uh, from the Gamecocks offense. So I think you do those things, and then that allows you to, to maybe go back and attack. And, and I think Carolina will turn up the tempo as well. We saw – we saw a little bit of a faster tempo, a, a rhythm last week, but I think there will be, in spots, there will be some really fast tempo uh, in this game. Emerson Phillips and Wes Mitchell here on the Gamecock Central Game Day podcast. Wes has got a fantastic interview with Gamecock quarterback commit Ryan Helensky out of California. We're going to let you hear that in just a few minutes here, and Helensky gives us some insight into what he sees happening in this Carolina-Georgia game today. Fantastic young man by all accounts. Wes, and I enjoyed listening to your interview with Ryan. We're going to play it in just a moment, but you mentioned before we started the podcast today that you've sort of gotten to know Ryan a little bit, and he'll be coming in next year. Wes, tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, just an outstanding kid. Um, You'll see or you'll hear here shortly um, just uh, very, very well-spoken, understands obviously the game of football as a quarterback, but is very good at breaking it down and sort of putting it into um, layman's terms as well. And 
um, you know, I, I've got to talk to Ryan about sort of his, his future as far as what he wants to study in and, and broadcasting is one of the potential paths that he might take and something he's leaning towards. So he joined us today as our sort of guest uh, analyst. And I, I think the fans are going to love to to hear what he has to say, man, because whenever this guy talks, um, he always has some unique insight and uh, just a great kid, as you'll hear, and, and a really good football player too, man. He's off to a great start in this season. He's put up some big passing numbers. You know, I, I think he's arguably the best passing quarterback in his class. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I've seen him seen him on film. I've seen him in uh, camp settings as well. Um, I'd love to get out to California and see him in person if uh, if uh, she was listening. That'd be a pretty cool trip. Uh, but uh, <laughs> have not have not been able to actually go see him in a game with him being, you know, on the other side of the country. But but yeah, man, uh, the kid has it all and. Um, certainly just uh, one of those guys that you have to pull for. All right, about 11 minutes here. Let's go ahead and listen in. Wes Mitchell interviewed Gamecock quarterback commit Ryan Helinski for the Gamecock Central Game Day podcast. And joining us now on the Gamecock Central podcast, we've got a very, very special guest, quarterback commit Ryan Helinski. Uh, Ryan, uh, first of all, thanks for joining us, man. You're uh, off to a, a good start in your season. How's everything going? Everything's going good. Uh, I'm just counting down the days till I can play in williams Bryce. I can tell you that much for sure. Uh, being Coach Werner, uh, I've been doing that every weekend. You know, we say, hey, it's one week closer to playing uh, on Saturdays. But uh, I'm doing good. Uh, started off the season pretty good so far. And um, everything's good with me and my family, though. I appreciate it. So I know, um, you know, you have been able to put up some, some big numbers. Uh, but what's the comfort level been like this year, maybe on the field, after you've worked so hard in the off season, is, you know, does the game – I know people talk about the game slows down. Is that mm-hmm. something that, that really happens, uh, you know, on the field? Sort of take us through your improvements in your own eyes, I guess. No, it definitely does. Um, a lot of people say that, you know, last year was our first year um, in the offense that we were in, um, running that spread-type offense. Um, uh-huh. And then, you know, we came back this year, second year, and uh, it just seems really more comfortable for me. You know, first game against San Juan Hills, um, their opponent, you know, that's pretty good out here in Southern California, and we beat them pretty good. Um, but they gave us some different looks and made me force some balls and do some certain things, but it was awesome. And then we play, of course, Corona Centennial the next week, um, and we have more touchdowns than incompletions in the first half. So uh-huh. um, it was just – it's awesome to see, you know, this offense that uh, – how, how far we've come from a year ago and just going out there sometimes um, and just seeing certain looks and saying, okay, I like this play versus that, checking us out of different plays. Um, mm-hmm. It's definitely a big improvement for all of us, um, and especially our O-linemen. I mean, we've played with a different O-line for the past three weeks. Like my left guard, my right guard, and my right tackle are all different every week so far. So um, uh-huh. our O-line coaches are doing a great job with that. Chris Crawford is my OC is doing a great job, but – um, we're all just playing to have fun, and I think that's when things get a little dangerous and you could have um, a very good ball team on your hand. But it's been a good year so far. Um, we've got two more weeks, uh, and then we hit Trinity League. So it'll be a good year, and I'm excited to see how we do. Now, uh, speaking of offense, uh, obviously you were able to watch the South Carolina Coastal game on TV. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, Carolina offense, especially the first team, pretty efficient, uh, you know, scored on uh, on every drive but one that, you know, the first team offense was in there. I, I yeah. know you and Coach Warner, you know, y'all have been talking about what the offense is going to look like. And, you know, you can see it on the board. You can see the scheme and stuff. You can hear about it. But uh, what, what was it like for you to actually sort of see everything they've been telling you actually sort of play out on, on the field with Jake as quarterback? Well, I think the biggest thing about this year is, you know, a lot of people were questioning Jake and, you know, how far you could take this offense. And we're just watching him Saturday in the opener, um, and you could always tell how good a team is based off their quarterback. And uh-huh. I definitely think South Carolina is going to be a team that's just blows people away this year. Um, he just looks comfortable. All these plays, I watched them do it, you know, when I was there. And Coach Warner showed me clips. And he was like, this is what we're supposed to do. And they ran that play, and I saw them do exactly what they were supposed to do, which is the awesome part. Um, their running game was really surprising to me, actually. Their running game looked really good, um, which is pretty good. I mean, if you can have a balanced offense like that uh, with the passing attack, you know, with Jake and Debo and Edwards and all of them on the outside, you're going to be pretty dangerous. And I think it was pretty cool to see just how comfortable um, and how confident everybody was playing, especially in your home opener, and you don't have those first-game jitters. Yeah, you, you mentioned the running game, um, obviously – 
key matchup for South Carolina today with Georgia. Um, mm-hmm. When you when you look at just the running game in general, I, I think especially when you're playing a you know a pretty elite defense, you know you always hear people talk about you have to have a running game to sort of maybe open up some things downfield to, to open yeah. up the play action pass. Uh, from from a quarterback's perspective, how, how much does it help when your backs are able to start to establish the run to for you to be able to then turn around and use that to make those explosive plays? It's huge. Um, I, our first game against San Juan Hill this year, we threw the ball 49 times, um, and we probably wow. rushed for about 50 to 60 yards um, that game. So people are like, oh, my, okay, they're just going to want to throw the ball. They've got all this firepower and stuff. Second game when we played Centennial, uh, we threw the ball about 35 to 40 times and threw for 300 yards, and we probably ran for about 40 to 50 yards. Um, and we only scored 28 points that game and then 27 the week before. In the following week, we played Vista Marietta, and we rushed for about, I want to say, 150 yards, and we threw for about 250, and we scored 42 points. Um, so when you can have a balanced offense, um, you keep the defense guessing, and you get light boxes where you can run the football, and then they want to crowd the box, and you have mm-hmm. people out there man-on-man, and Edwards and all these guys, and you're running concepts, um, and they have too, too many less guys. You have to cover those guys. You know, you can't just leave the box empty, and it just goes back and forth. They just counteract each other. If you have a light box, you're going to run the football. If you have a heavy box, you got to pass the football. And I think South Carolina can do both of those things, um, which makes them so lethal. It, yeah, and I, I know um, it, it used to be a lot of times, uh, you know, you're, you're audible and out of a play. You know, if you, if you see one yeah. thing, you audible something else. Now, um, it, you know, everybody sort of just has it packaged in together. How You know, how – how lethal can it be to when you have the ability as a quarterback to if you you know if you see that you know you have your your pass play attached to a run and mm-hmm. you just pull the ball and not hand it off uh, if that's there how, you know how much freedom does that maybe give you as a quarterback to be able to do those things? It's it's crazy big because we run the same type of offense that South Carolina runs um, and you have these second level RPOs is what we call them and Coach Warner and I have agreed. <laughs> have agreed upon when we use certain terms. Um, uh-huh. But when you could have those second-level RPOs, meaning you're reading a safety or an outside linebacker covering, and say he wants to insert in the box and he leaves that slot receiver uncovered and you hit him right behind his head for a hitch route, and, you know, mm-hmm. he can't pick both. You have to pick your poison. Do you want to stop the run or do you want to bet that I can't complete that pass and the receiver can't catch the ball? Um, and it just goes back and forth. I mean, the safety wants to insert in the box. Okay, I'm going to throw a big post over your head. And that's just the read. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about the RPO system and doing those second-level defender reads is because they usually can't be right unless they want to stack the box and go man outside, which I don't think most people want to do against South Carolina with the receivers that we have. Um, and especially if you want to put out guys outside, I think we can run the ball pretty efficiently well. Now, uh, you said you, you talk, or you watched the Georgia game on TV as well. They obviously yes, had Austin awesome TV did. Uh, last week. you know, But – both, both teams sort of just did did what they were supposed to do on the scoreboard last week. Yeah. They blew out teams that they were kind of supposed to. So yeah. uh, much bigger test for both teams this week. But what, what were your maybe impressions uh, watching the Oregon <laughs> last week? Yeah, I was watching. I actually um, I started watching it at home, and then I went to Chili's um, with my grandparents <laughs> and my dad and my mom. Um, and uh, the game was on there. I was like, okay, sweet. I can continue watching it. And I remember it was the second quarter, and I see Justin Fields go in. And I'm like, mm-hmm. they still haven't, like, what? This is Jake Fromm who led him to the national championship game. And, yeah. you know, they're still trying to figure out that two-quarterback system. And I think that causes, caused a little bit of trust issues, timing off functions with the wide receivers and stuff like that. Uh-huh. Um, and it just, it just didn't look as smoothly as it could have gone offensively. Um, I mean, of course, you have big plays, and that's what five stars are supposed to do against Austin P. Um, right. <laughs> but I think it could have gone way more smoothly. Um, and I think South Carolina's offense looked way better than Georgia's offense in that, in that respected area. Now, when you just look at these two teams or, or just really any two major programs like this in mm-hmm. general, what are, what are maybe your keys, uh, keys to win and, and maybe, uh, maybe some thoughts or predictions? What, what do you think is going to happen on Saturday? Well, I think the biggest thing um, when it comes to, you know, two big SEC things um, is, of course, the defense. Uh, SEC is known for the defense, and they've got to stop plays, and they've got to do these things. Um, and I think with just, you know, the defense and Coach Muschamp's mentality, you know, they've got to establish hard hit and face in the mouth because 
when you go out there and you hit people in the face, um, SEC football, you know, people are a little bit more reluctant on coming off the edge or doing certain uh-huh. things on that receiver or quarterback. Um, of course, you got to establish defensive and physicality from the beginning. Um, but like we talked about earlier, you got to establish a run game. And I think whoever owns the line of scrimmage, um, whoever a line is dominating the other defensive line, I think it's going to be a key to success. Um, and whoever is the better quarterback on the day. Uh, I think, you know, we see it. We saw it um, when Connor Saw played, Stephen Garcia played, when they knocked off those top opponents. They were the better quarterback that day. Um, mm-hmm. and that's what a team relies on. And if, if your quarterback's not playing well, the team's not going to play well. So I think Jake's got to have a big day, and I think he's definitely up for living up to the task. Um, and I'm sure he's excited, and Coach Warner and Coach McClendon are preparing him well for it. Yeah, you, you got a score prediction? Score prediction. I've seen a lot of them, so I'm not going to sway a little bit. But I'm thinking 28-25 South Carolina. Okay, I got you. I dig it. I think the uh, South Carolina faithful – We'll uh, we'll like to hear that as well, um, Ryan. Uh, we appreciate the time. Before we let you go, we did, we got to get uh, a Ryan Holinsky, um Gamecock uh, recruiting pitch. I, I know that I know you've been working on this. I know that you have been recruiting guys ever since you yeah. committed. So what what's the message right now that you're uh, delivering? Uh, and are, are you still talking to guys uh, fairly no, often? No, I'm, I'm I'm finding my way around the system of being off Twitter and Instagram. I'm still talking to guys. Trust me. <laughs> We're not leaving that too open, but uh, whenever I talk to those guys, I just say, where do you want to play football, and where do you want to have the best life after football? And with the connections in South Carolina and Coach Muschamp um, and Coach Werner and Miss Jessica Jackson and all these people that are looking, of course, Coach Lattimore, and all these people just looking out for you, um, it's just so much more than football. And that's what I realized. You know, it, I could have gone – easily to the other USC down the road, and we don't need to talk about them, or UCLA down the road. Um, but when I visited South Carolina, there's no other university like it. There's no other coaching staff like it. There's no other people like it. And if you want to go somewhere where you can play football um, and have a family atmosphere, uh, South Carolina is a place for you, and I know all the other kids feel the same exact way as me. Um, and they're excited to just go out there and show up for the best fans in the country. That's uh, Gamecocks quarterback commit, Ryan Holinsky. Uh, Ryan, we certainly appreciate the time, appreciate the insight, and uh, we'll talk to you soon, okay, man? Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Appreciate it, sir. Great stuff, Wes. Holinsky sounds like a fine young man, and I know Gamecock Nation is looking forward to getting him on campus. Yeah, and, uh, you know, this is a, a tough weekend for, for his family, and, you know, I, I purposely didn't really go into it uh, with with Ryan or bring it up, but, um, you know, they're, they're at Washington State this weekend where his, his brother – his late brother is being honored. So, um, you know, certainly want to send out all of our thoughts to, to that family with what they're going through. And and as you can see, man, or, or here, Ryan, very, very well-spoken kid. He, he broke it down. I'm at, I, I, t- I told him, you know, he's got a future in that once he's done with football if he wants it. I, I mean, if he wants to be an analyst, uh, you know, be a Kirk Herbstreet type, uh, I think that's definitely in, in his future if he wants it. Yeah, there was a fantastic – story on ESPN.com three days ago, in fact, by Ivan Mazel on the Holinsky family. Very touching and compelling, so I would encourage you to check that out if you want to get a little bit more background on the Holinsky family. Ryan Holinsky coming up from California to join Gamecock football next year. Or Actually, he'll enroll in January, won't he, Wes? Yes, he will be a January enrollee. Um, you know, as he said, he's sort of counting down the days he and uh, the quarterback's coach, Dan Warner, are, but so it won't be long, uh, yeah. a matter of months, and he will be in Columbia and uh, competing for that quarterback job. Fantastic. All right, good stuff with Ryan Helinski here, Gamecock quarterback commit. Wes, let's turn our attention back to today's Georgia game, 339 official kick time, national TV game on CBS. Mm-hmm. A couple of top 25 teams. Georgia's ranked number three in the country coming in. All right, Wes, let's head back to the Gamecock Central hotline. We'll give you that number again. It's available to you 24-7. You'll be – You'll receive a voicemail prompt. Just leave us a voice message. Leave your name and your question, and we will put your call, your recording, on next week's Gamecock Central Game Day podcast. The number is 497-9058. That's area code 803-497-9058. Let's go to the GC hotline. Mystery caller today. Hey, Wes. With USC only taking the, the one deep shot against Coastal, do you think USC will do more to stretch the field vertically against Georgia? Thank you. Yeah, I, I do think so, Emerson. I mean, I think we we have to see that. I, I think you have to be able to, uh, you know, 
spread the field, but you also have to expand the field vertically if you're going to do everything you want to do. And I think we've heard all off season about about deep shots. We've heard all off season about uh, aggressiveness from this offensive scheme. So um, we didn't see it last week because South Carolina, frankly, didn't really have to do it. They just methodically uh, were able to to do basically what they wanted last week. So will we see more of that? I, I think absolutely. Does it lead to a big play or two? If you're a South Carolina fan, you hope so. But even if it doesn't, that at the very least makes Georgia's secondary uh, be aware of the deep ball, makes them creep back a little bit, and gives you a little more room to operate underneath. So I would uh, I would actually say probably pretty early, Emerson. I think pretty early in the game you'll see South Carolina um, take a deep shot or two. Yes, sir. Stretch that field, going to let Georgia know that the Gamecocks are – ready today and, and test that defense, you know, see what they can do on the back end. So I agree completely. I think the Gamecocks open it up a little bit today, if need be. So thanks again right. to our mystery caller. She didn't give us her name, but we appreciate the phone call, 497-9058. If you want to be a part of the Gamecock Central Game Day podcast, just leave us a voicemail with your question, your name, where you're calling from, and we'll get you in on next week's show. So, Wes, you know, a lot to talk about today and so many different angles to discuss in terms of Georgia, South Carolina. You know, my favorite angle, I think, is the fact that the game has moved back early in the schedule. I like this game from a South Carolina perspective being early in the season. I think that helps the Gamecocks a little bit. Rodney Nabolsi from UGASports.com joined us on GCR earlier this week, and he said that he thinks that helps South Carolina too because Georgia, you know, traditionally has more depth than South Carolina. And when the Gamecocks play Georgia in week seven or eight, if Carolina's got any injuries, that's going to favor Georgia. But when Carolina's fully healthy, you know, particularly with their starters, then that, that favors the Gamecocks. So it makes sense that it helps Carolina to play Georgia earlier in the year. And I think the Gamecocks have proven, you know, by having some success against Georgia in that second game of the year, that uh, that's where the game suits them best. Yeah, and I think um, we've seen Emerson – even South Carolina teams that aren't maybe as good or as talented as this one, we've seen them give Georgia trouble in, in this exact scenario early in the season at williams Bryce Stadium. And, you know, a lot of times both teams are still working out kinks. And in the past it was a lot of times I think a kind of low scoring type, you know, grinded out SEC type of, type of matchup. But um, I don't quite expect that from this game. But I do think uh, – you know, having having Debo Samuel, obviously last year, by the time the two teams played, South Carolina did not have Debo Samuel. Um, you know, is, is Debo Samuel the best player on the field, um, it, you know, regardless of team? I, I think you make that argument that he probably is. So uh, you, you get back a difference maker. If they can find a way to get him the football in space, then, uh, then there's your answer right there on, on why that's important. And, you know, I, I think other years, when South Carolina has not quite had the depth that Georgia maybe does, um, and that's probably the case this year too, you're still early in the year, so you haven't had guys either worn down or, or banged up. So, it, you know, every team by week six, seven, eight has guys banged up, but if they have good depth, then it's next guy up, you know, whereas South Carolina hasn't always had that. Yeah, a lot of questions about today's game, and we're about to start getting some answers. Looking forward to it. Wes, I heard the Will Muschamp press conference earlier this week talking about Georgia and also heard some of Kirby Smart's comments about South Carolina during his midweek press conference this week. And I was really happy to hear a healthy show of respect by both head coaches for the other school and for the other program this week. Muschamp obviously is a Georgia grad. He had good things to say about Kirby Smart and that Georgia program. And Kirby Smart had some very nice things to say about Gamecock football. In fact, he talked about Georgia embracing the challenge really all summer of having to play at Williams-Brice, a place where Georgia has had problems in years past. Yeah, and I think, you know, it was very clear to me. Um, well, one, you know, everybody knows Muschamp and Kirby are longtime friends. Um, they don't really talk on game week uh, at all, it, it sounds like. But they, they have known each other forever. I, I think if you look at any matchup in the country, there's probably not two head coaches that know each other as well as these two know each other. And it was pretty clear to me, neither one was going to at all mess around with any possibility of giving, you know, bulletin board locker room material um, at all. So uh, none of, you know, neither one of them even messed with that at all. Um, 
And uh, there, there's obviously a respect for the two programs and what they've been able to do and, and how they've built it. And, um, you know, you, you mentioned obviously Columbia and, and Georgia not playing as well or having trouble in, in Columbia. And I, I think something we haven't necessarily hit on, Emerson, is uh, how hot it's going to be on Saturday. And the fact that one thing Kirby Smart did say in his press conference is um, he questioned his guys' conditioning a little bit last week. So I, I don't know if that was coach speak. I don't know if that was gamemanship, if that was real, if that was him challenging his guys. I don't, I don't know what it was, but I do know he said the words conditioning. And if that's even a thought, then I feel bad for any – I feel bad for the fans that aren't in condition to sit in this at williams Wright <laughs> Stadium. So, I mean, you got to throw on, you know, uh, some pads and a helmet and a jersey and go out and run around in this stuff. Um, if, if that's remotely real, then maybe there's an advantage for South Carolina there because they've, they've been in this junk all summer long. That's right, and if you don't like playing in the heat, williams Bryce early in the season might not be for you, so we're going to find out today, yeah. Wes. Man, it's going to be a lot of fun. Really looking forward to today's game, and, you know, again, I think a chance for Carolina to pick up its first signature win in the Will Muschamp era. Wes, clearly, if Carolina can win this game today, it will be the biggest win since Muschamp took over. Yeah, and, and like we said, man, it's, it's an opportunity. How many, uh, how many opportunities do you get against a top five team at your place when you're at you know, full go. You have most of your guys. You have all your offense healthy. Um, when you have the, the guys to really match up, how many chances do you get if you're South Carolina to, to go do that? You know, so I, I think um, th- this is the year for South Carolina to go get them. And, you know, if, if Georgia beats South Carolina, then, then it's like a, a 30 second, one minute clip on Sports Center. Like it, it's kind of expected from a national standpoint. Right. But if South Carolina beats Georgia, then that is pro- that's probably your lead story um, nationally in college football this weekend because, A, th- there's not really uh, uh, many other marquee games. I mean, game days at Clemson and Texas A&M, which, uh, I mean, that, that to me isn't a, a great elite matchup. So, um, you know, it's, not, it's, a, it's a huge opportunity because if South Carolina wins this week, uh, the whole college football, unless there's some crazy upset, the whole college football – We'll be talking about what that win means. That's true. Gamecocks will probably lead Sports Center tonight if they can beat Georgia, but uh, a lot of football to be played before that happens. So, <laughs> getting ahead. ahead of myself a little bit. <laughs> well, I think we've been doing it all week, you know, talking about the possibilities for a Gamecock win, but the Gamecocks have got to go out and do it on the field now. So, that's where we are. Let's get uh, Colin Taylor. He's our staff writer from Gamecock Central, and he's got Carolina's keys to victory today. So obviously this is the biggest game on South Carolina's, especially early game schedule, but could be the whole year. Uh, Winner gets into the driver's seat in the SEC East. And as with a lot of South Carolina games, the, it comes down to the two lines of scrimmage. South Carolina needs to be able to run the ball against Georgia. They need to keep things manageable. They, they don't need to be getting in third down in long situations. Um, and they need to force Georgia into not being able to move the ball quickly down the field and kind of having to, to – do different things offensively to move the ball instead of running it downhill, which is Georgia's kind of bread and butter. So if they could win the battles up front, I think they have a good shot. And defensively, they need to be able to force turnovers and stop Georgia from scoring touchdowns. If they can limit them to field goals for the most part, I think South Carolina has a chance. Um, And that's really, really the big thing for them. That's Colin Taylor with Gamecock keys to victory. And now for Georgia Bulldogs keys, We'll send it to Roddy Nabolsi, the publisher of UGASports.com. That's our Rivals Network partner. First key to victory for Georgia would be to run the ball. I know that's very boring, but Georgia's built to run it. When you have, you know, uh, across the line, an average offensive lineman at six foot five, 314 pounds, uh, those are big men, and they should be able to lean on somebody and push. I mean, they're not the, the quickest linemen you'll have, but they're strong. Georgia's got a stable of running backs. If they can run the ball, then they can control it. The last thing you want to do is keep giving Jake Bentley uh, time to pick you apart. So Georgia needs to control the clock, control the number of possessions, and run the ball. Uh, that's most important for Georgia offensively. The key for Georgia's defense is to stop the run, take away Williams and Battle, uh, at least try to make uh, South Carolina one-dimensional. But the problem there is Jake Bentley can pick Georgia apart. Georgia's secondary has a couple of young guys in it. Uh, Tyson Campbell is a true freshman starting at one of the corner spots. Uh, Tariq McGee's been injured. This will be his first game if he makes it back. Their starting uh, star position is very inexperienced to William Poole. 
uh, or D'Angelo Gibbs. So Georgia has some definite uh, inexperience in the secondary, but I think it would be a lot better for Georgia to try to make South Carolina one-dimensional, take away the run first, because they need to do that with their hogs up front. If they can do that, then uh, it's on the secondary to win it. So those are your two keys to the game. Thank you, Rodney. Rodney Nabolsi from UGASports.com, our Rivals Network partner with Georgia's Keys to Victory. Wes, let's get it on, brother. Hey, let's do it, man. I'm ready. The fans are ready. You're ready. Uh, the Gamecocks are ready. The Bulldogs are ready. Uh, let's do this thing. All right, we'll get it started, and we appreciate you joining us here on Gamecock Central Radio. We'll be back next week for another game day podcast. Big thanks to Chris Clark, Colin Taylor, and Rodney Nabolsi. And thanks to you, Wes, for giving us that uh, Ryan Helinski interview. We appreciate Ryan joining us. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of fun, man. We'll do it again next week. Let's do it. That's Wes Mitchell, and I'm Emerson Phillips. Thanks for joining us, and enjoy the ball game.